Okay, well, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining in tonight. Uh, there's a few people I saw on the screen that don't know me, so I thought I'd introduce myself first. I'm the AWG president this year, and this is the first attempt that we've had at doing a lecture for what we hope will be a continuing DLP Distinguished Lecture Program Series. Uh, if anyone has ideas about timing, we don't have the next one scheduled yet, and or lecture, uh, please let us know. I'll put our email address in the chat box as okay. just an aside. Um, anyways, tonight being our first one, we are really grateful to have Catherine, Dr. Catherine Schilling here to talk to us. As you all know, her title is Exposure Assessment and Disease Detection, How Metal Stable Isotopes Often Offer Unique Insights. I'm just gonna do a couple of intro notes on Dr. Schilling, and these I took from her short bio that I'm sure you all have read, but let me just reiterate those. Uh, Catherine is an analytical and isotope geochemist. Her interdisciplinary research brings high precision metal isotope analyses that are currently firmly based in their sciences into a synergistic space with multiple new approaches in environmental health sciences. Dr. Schilling explores various metal isotope systems as biomarkers for environmental carcinogens, nutrient status, and as source tracers of metal exposure using high resolution multi-collector ICP mass spectrometry. Um, <laughs> really impressive, Catherine. And I am so excited. When I first talked to you at AGU in Chicago, and you told me what you were working on. I just thought, oh, we really need you as a speaker. <laughs> Thank you. <so> much. <laughs> I, I know I'm being really selfish, but I want to learn about this. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyways, take it away. It's all yours. Thank you, Deb. It's so nice. Uh, and thank you all for joining. I, I mean, in New York, it's now 7 p.m. <laughs> and, um, so, yeah, I'm, I want to introduce introduce you to a new field which I said which you already said um said it started off in earth sciences and now slowly transitions the tool of using isotope metal isotopes as a tool in environmental health sciences and the biomedical sciences to detect uh, diseases maybe as an early uh, tool of early uh, detection or to um better understand exposure to metals, uh, the sources of exposure, and isotopes can be very helpful because it's a very, very sensitive tool and much, much better than what it used currently in environmental health sciences. They just basically measure metal concentrations in biospecimens. And uh, I give you, so let's start. So when we think of an element, so I like this idea, it's like these are all essential metals we need. We need zinc, we need iron, we need calcium. And when you go to a pharmacy or a grocery store, you can all see the supplements you can buy. Um, but when I, as an isotope chemist, think of these elements, I see them in their, as their isotopes. So zinc, for example, has five stable isotopes. Iron has three stable isotopes. And calcium has four stable isotopes. So that's the way how I see it when I go to the uh, grocery store and I see the supplements. And it's like, okay, but, so what happens if we take these supplements with those kind with this isotopic composition? What happens in our body? Um, so first off, what are isotopes? Well, I'm sure you probably most of you know about it, but I thought that because it's an interesting story behind that. So isotopes have the same number. Uh, so isotopes have the same numbers of protons and the same number of electrons, but they have a slightly different mass, and that's because of they have a different numbers of no neutrons. And that's why they behave chemically slightly different. The first person who found out about uh, isotopes and is Frederick Soddy. He was a British chemist, 
And he found that this is the same element he did experiments with, but he found that it slightly behaved different. He was sure it is the same element. Um, and then he talked to a friend uh, at the time, but he couldn't have, couldn't describe it very well. So he described it, but he didn't have a term for it. So he talked to his friend, Margaret Todd. She was a female doctor um, and a writer. And uh, she gave him the idea, why don't you use the term I, um, isotope from ISO, from the Greek word isos, same and topos place. So it's in the same place in the periodic table, but still they behave slightly different. Interestingly, Frederick Saudi, uh, because we are now all women at this, uh, this talk, he actually got all the credits for it. So he received uh, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for his findings and also the, that he found it like calling it isotopes. And years later, uh, it was just acknowledged that it was actually not his idea coming up with the term isotopes, that it was actually Mark Brett Todd. Um, so then moving to the other two guys on the right, it's JJ Thompson and Francis Aston. Both of them were physicists, British physicists, and they developed the first mass spectrometer to measure the different isotopes. Also, these two guys received a Nobel Prize. So what we see here is uh, three men, three Nobel Prize, one woman, not even acknowledged for her contribution in the field. So, <clears throat> and uh, being uh, uh, at Columbia University, I also have to mention one of the pioneers in isotope geochemistry, uh, that is Professor Yure. He is the one who discovered heavy uh, water. So basically the heavy isotope of water. And he already, he wrote in his, uh, in, he received also the Nobel Prize in chemistry. Um, and he uh, write, wrote a very fundamental paper on how isotopes behave differently. And that's because of their thermodynamic properties. And he really nicely describes it in his paper from 1946, where he says, I quote it here, it's like isotopes and isotopic compounds differ in their thermodynamic properties. Um, these small differences make it possible um, that they separate, isotope separates into different compartments, like uh, in a liquid phase, a gaseous phase, or a solid phase. And he already uh, discovered that this could be very, has very important implication in for um, in earth sciences. He was a chemist, so not in earth sciences, but he could already see that we can better understand um, a reaction and mechanism um, in uh, geological formations. So the reason why is uh, basically, um, I need to move that, uh, why uh, do isotope fractionates? So the, the reason for the fractionation of isotopes is because of the different energy level. So if you look at the graph on the left, you see it needs a certain energy to kind of transform or convert into a different species of phase. Um, so if you have heavy isotopes, you need much more energy to get over this ramp here than for light isotopes. So there are very simple rule of thumb. So lighter isotopes react much faster than um, heavy isotopes, that's basically on, based on the energy level. Um, when you think of bonding, uh, heavy isotopes uh, build stronger bonds. Um, then when you think of the fractionation, so the separation of isotopes into different phases, uh, let's say uh, aqueous phase and uh, water, water, water phase, then uh, the isotope fractionation is larger for lighter elements because there's a larger mass difference between a light isotope and a heavy isotope. And reaction where there is a change in oxidation state, it's normally larger. So when you think of iron, you have iron two and iron three. If it changes from iron three to iron two, the fractionation is larger than when you have binding of iron three onto let's say an amino acid because there is no change in oxidation state. Um, so, and as I said, these isotopes, um, isotope geochemistry has actually uh, revolutionized uh, the understanding in, in earth sciences and it has a, was, and is already a, is a very established field and metal isotopes are very powerful to understand the formation of our solar system. 
So the, for example, the formation of the or the origin of the moon is uh, was published in I think 2018 or so um, in Nature Geosciences, and also uh, the evolution of life on Earth. Uh, it's a science paper where they discovered when was uh, how much atmospheric oxygen was there and that the life could develop on Earth. So my thinking was then, okay, if it's applicable in earth sciences to understand reaction formations, uh, then I think we should also be possible in, it should be possible in the medical, bi medical field and environmental health sciences, because every object is defined by its elemental and isotopic composition. So it doesn't matter if it's a rock, if it's water, free, if it's a human. So I thought if it's a human, it should also be possible to understand reaction in the human body. Because uh, we are made out of isotopes. Uh, so mainly we are made of isotopes of the major elements, carbon, uh, that's a half carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, a uh, little bit of sulfur, a little bit of hydrogen. And but to a small extent, we also are made of all other elements which are either essential metals, let's think of copper and zinc and iron, calcium and magnesium, they have isotopes, but we are also made of all the toxic metals or part of our body are stored all the toxic metals like mercury, lead, um, antimony, all the other these elements which are toxic, we are exposed to them and they will change reaction in our body or they will be incorporated in, part in our tissue, in our bones. And how does that work? And how can we understand the way, how we are exposed to them, where they are from, and what they do in our body? So basically what isotopes, when we measure the isotope ratios, it, this can tell us why, how, and where the changes occur in the body. So the first time uh, so they looked at, as someone looked at isotopic um, composition in uh, biological human human samples was in 2002, a group from Germany. They looked at the isotopic composition of iron in blood. I think it was just out of curiosity, I have to say, because they had a, they had instrumentation and I was like, okay, let's let's see if we see any differences. And surprisingly, they found that the blood is just like, you can see it here in the top, I highlighted it in, 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 in red. They looked at blood from female, male and children. And when you look to go to the left, we have more light isotopes. And when we go to the right, we have more heavy uh, uh, isotopes of iron. And what they found is there's a difference, which you see females tend to have a little bit more of the heavy isotope, 56, compared uh, um, to the men. And that, that was a finding they were not expecting, I guess. Uh, and I was like, okay, what's the reason for that difference between uh, gender difference? And they think it has something to do, they interpret it as something to do with the iron absorption in the human body. But basically that was the start that is said, oh, there is some reaction now happening in the human body, which fractionates isotopes. And we need to understand that better. So from that time on, it slowly, slowly started to develop uh, still within the earth sciences, people who were interested a little bit in the environmental health field, in the biomedical field, and got like uh, uh, hands on some of the samples or had uh, collaborations, started uh, to work on different metals and uh, started the field of isotope metallomics. So we, for a long time, it's used to commonly use metals. If you look at the periodic tables, are carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and sulfur. Um, there are already publications out that looked at magnesium, calcium, um, potassium, iron, copper, zinc, and lead isotopes in the human body. Uh, and I think all elements of future interest in the isotopic composition in the human body could be cadmium, we are exposed, which is a toxic element, interacts with copper and zinc, mercury, nickel, molybdenum, or uranium. Because what all this does, so we are exposed from the environment, we can either trace, for example, for toxic metals like lead or mercury, we could use this when we to trace the source. And if it's a, a source, which is um, uh, in basically a recent source we were exposed to, for example, in lead or 
it is, it is a source uh, we have been exposed to years ago because lead is an element which stays in our body for decades. Um, uh, it can, we can also tell some reaction in our body, how they change. It can tell us something about our diet what type of food we are eating, or some changes. But I said dysregulation um, and the effect of uh, leading to diseases for women changing in the menstrual cycle can have an effect on these, as I said, for essential metals like iron, and zinc, and copper. Um, so it has a huge potential, potential to understand uh, the outside world uh, and the metals we are exposed to, what basically what we eat, and then what our body does with it. So what I want to do is basically bring the isotope alarmics field together with the envi environmental health science field. So I'm located now in the Department of Environmental Health Sciences. And the advantage of isotope metalomics, I always tell them, is basically when you have biological samples, and very often they have uh, in, in the environmental health sciences, they have cohort studies of thousands of participants, and they have been stored for sometimes years. So some studies we are doing that have collected samples 20 years ago. So the advantage with isotopes is they don't change. So we currently, they are using, or often it's used uh, bio um, uh, organic uh, biomarkers or biomarkers, but of course, uh, um, organic biomarkers degrade over time, but the isotopes in the samples don't. So it should be, it's much, much better using isotopes, the isotopic composition, uh, because it can be preserved in organic um, markers. And of course, they can tell us a bit about, uh, isotopes can tell us about the human metabolism and potential use as the potential tool to diagnose diseases. And um, for what's important in the terms of environmental health sciences, it can give us information about biological processes in the body. As I said, if you have a change in redox condition in your body, for example, if you think someone um, develops um, cancer, there is a, a hypoxia, so that you change the condition in your body, you have a lot of oxidative stress, uh, that means you will change the oxidation condition in your body, so redox reactions. And as I said, ox change in oxidation state will lead to changes uh, in the isotopic composition. Also, when you have developed a disease because of oxidative stress, the binding of metals to protein can change because either the proteins are oxidized, uh, the binding environment change. So that's something isotope can tell us. Um, and then it's a, a biomarker, which uh, isotopes can, are fast responding. So currently when you do metal concentration measurements only, uh, you have to do a lot of measurements to see maybe a change and it's, it's less sensitive than um, if you look at isotopic composition, which is like uh, at least uh, two orders of magnitude more sensitive than measuring concentrations. So isotope metalomics has been already, what I said, applied to um, different, uh, has, uh, it, with different approaches. Um, people have used it to understand um, uh, infectious diseases, no, not infectious, genetic diseases, uh, ALS or Wilson disease, uh, but I have to say all of the studies are very, very small. So they have a small sample size and normally for this type of, if you want to prove it, the, the concept, you need to have larger, um, I mean, we have proved the concept that it works, uh, but we need to have now larger studies uh, on health outcomes uh, and what, what else it changes the effects of isotopic composition in the body. Then it has been used to understand for calcium isotopes have been used to understand the, um, the bone health. Uh, for example, it's much more sensitive to look at calcium isotopes in urine to diagnose osteoporosis um, than any other screening technique, which is very interesting. And it uh, has been looked at the bone metabolism of children. So it's uh, good to understand if you give, thing, if you give calcium supplements, uh, for example, uh, you could see if the bone health will improve if you look at calcium isotropic composition in urine. Um, it has also been uh, used to understand if can we use isotopes to understand the aging process, like we are using aging clocks to understand what is our uh, what is our uh, genetic versus our age. Um, 
So we can use isotopes because the isotopes are uh, different proteins are expressed differently in our, throughout our life cycle. Um, different expression of metalloproteins, um, if they change, they, uh, they are either over or under expressed, then this can give us a signal <clears throat> when we look at blood or when we look at um, uh, uh, urine, uh, the aging record. And they have proved that uh, in a nice mouse model. Um, another is like, it's an early detector for cancer. Um, as I said, it's uh, two orders of magnitude more sensitive than looking at concentration. So together with concentration and the isotope becomes we can see much earlier the change in um, <clears throat> reactions and uh, metabolic changes caused by cancer and in its early pro probably in its early stage. Um, and the reason why this is possible it was not possible um, it's possible now, it was not possible in the past, is now the instrumentation are more sensitive. It just developed like 20 years ago, the instrumentation was so sensitive, the multi-collector ICPMS uh, is the instrument to use to measure isotopes in, in a very high precision. So what we can do, we measure the isotopes of one element simultaneously. So that gives us a very good precision of <clears throat> uh, 0.005% why we think of when you think of a concentration measurement of metals the precision is about five percent so and the uncertainty is in the promil range so with, with that, that very very high precision we can much easier detect um small changes and as you can see from the year 2000 i just did a quick ncbi search from 2000 to 2020 the numbers of publication where people use the multi-collector icpms uh, increase because more institutions have it, but they also understood the huge potential of measuring isotopes still mainly in environmental uh, sciences and earth sciences. So now a bit about isotope metallomics and its application. So we did a study. So where does it start? When you think of a human body, we have to go back to very the fundamental uh, mechanism and to understand where do metals, essential or toxic metal binds. And they bind to proteins. But what are proteins? Proteins are made of uh, amino acids. And going what amino acids are, they have different ligands where the metals bind to. So <clears throat> there are, our proteins are made of the main amino acids in our body, cysteine, chromatic acid, and histidine. And if you look at histidine has sulfur, where the metals bind onto sulfur. For chromatic acid, it's oxygen. And for histidine, it's nitrogen. So all of those uh, bind uh, the metals differently, or not the metal differently, but different metal isotopes. So cysteine preferentially binds uh, light isotopes. Um, that has something to do with the bonding strengths. And histidine uh, binds preferentially heavy isotopes. But this was only done in a um, ther theoretical model, say that's Theoretically, that should be the way how we bind it. So all, all our studies we did so far, or it has been done so far, is based on the assumption um, that cysteine binds light, uh, histidine binds heavy. So all the interpretation we have right now on, um, I, for example, this iron isotopes in blood is based on this theory, but it has never been experimentally proven that this is correct. So we did a first study, uh, I did it together with Rutgers University, and we looked at how copper binds on these three different um, uh, um, ligands. And we could prove, so this paper from Pucci et al is this theoretical model. And then what did we measure? It's, it's the black uh, uh, circle. So that's the modeled way is uh, the red square. And that's what we measured. And luckily it, it fits very well. So it matches the theoretical model and the measured results are very close that's good so that means everything which we've so far interpreted as the mechanisms are cor is is correct and based on that we hypothesized or we have this idea okay when we know we have the heavy isotopes and the light isotopes and we know to which are bind to the proteins and this is not only applicable in the biomedical field so that we also have a huge um, application 
for um, geobiology to understand how these metals bind in, in, in bacteria in, uh, in, uh, or de <clears throat> developing uh, the early earth, uh, the, the developing of life. Uh, and of course, for the human health. So it has huge implications, um, applications, uh, how these metals bind to amino acids and then the proteins, it's, a, it's an acid's larger form, basically. So then can we use a metal stabilized loop as a cancer biomarker? Um, so we started, the first study was done looking at uh, some, um, it was uh, Fiona Lana, she looked at breast cancer uh, patients' uh, tissue, and she found there's a difference between the malignant um, tissue, isotopic composition of zinc, compared to the healthy tissue. But the mechanism was not clear uh, why and how that happened. So then I did an experiment uh, looking at cell lines to understand, okay, when the zinc goes into the cell, what we know is that cancer cells um, breast cancer cells tend to accumulate a lot of zinc. It means there must be a protein which shuffles in a lot of zinc into the cell and doesn't release it out of the cell. So either there are more proteins expressed, which can bring in zinc into the cells, or the transporters which transport it out of the cells, they're kind of not existent anymore. So that it slowly accumulates. So what we did, we grew cells, cancer, breast cancer cells with zinc, and then measure the isotropic composition. And what we found is basically, it was slightly different of what she saw in, saw in, in her in vivo, uh, in, her, in, her, in her tissue um, data, where she found there is a difference, but actually in the experiment, we didn't see that much of different, or we saw the, the opposite different. Then later on, she repeated the experiment and she could not see the signal. Again, that there is a difference between the healthy and the malignant tissue. But what we can could, could see that um, cells tend to um, incorporate isotopically light zinc, and that has something to do with the proteins they bring in the zinc into the cells. So the idea was, okay, <clears throat> it started off, okay, uh, there could be potentially different, maybe looking at the tissue and looking at the malignant versus the healthy tissue is maybe not always the best approach. Maybe we can look at much easier because then you have to get a biopsy and you have to get a healthy tissue and you have to get the malignant tissue. So you need to find a way, a different way how to detect uh, cancer. And ideally, you either get a blood samples or urine samples. And our, our the, the thought was that if you have, if you are in a healthy group, then that's basically your isotopic composition is basically varies a little bit um, depending on what you are eating on that day or so for zinc or for any other essential metal. But once you develop a disease, for example, cancer, your isotopic composition changes. And that changes what I said because of the oxidative stress in your body, changes in protein expression. And we can detect that much earlier with the isotopes than we can currently detect tumors. So that has been, again, why, why this idea was the first one it was shown for liver cancer, that there was a difference in copper isotopic composition for liver cancer patient. Then we showed it for pancreatic cancer in urine. And it has been also shown for ovarian uh, cancer, the isotopic composition changes. And what I wanted to do is like to focus on like, let's find a biomarker, which is easy accessible or like in a biospecimen which we can easily measure or people are willing to give more sample. So I think it's good to focus on urine. So it's like, okay, let's, we collected sample from healthy uh, volunteers and from people who had pancreatic cancer. And the idea is when you have, when you're healthy, your proteins, the kidney holds back all the, um, the proteins, but also it's like the, whatever you measure in the urine is uh, magnifying the signal what you have in the blood. So blood is more complex. It has a lot of proteins and we might, may not see the small difference caused uh, by developing cancer or uh, some changes, what I said, in the protein expression. We might not see that in, in the blood because it's more complex, but urine, um, it's, it's uh, like a simpler matrix. Uh, so what we think is like if you measure the dis if you have a disease and you filter the blood and the urine magnifies the isotropic signal and the change 
uh, when we look at the isotopes. And that change uh, tells us that there is a disease development. And what we found is for pancreatic cancer, uh, we look at a healthy control group over 50, because that's about the age um, where uh, people develop pancreatic cancer. I think the average is about 63. Um, and we see that people with pancreatic cancer have a slightly isotopic lighter composition uh, in their urine for zinc than the healthy control. So it's shifted towards um, the light isotopes. Uh, and that was very interesting, but of course we need to, the sample size was very small and we had already people who had pancreatic, pancreatic cancer. What we wanna know is like some, and they were all in, most of them were in the later stage of the disease. So is it something we can, if we start early on, or people with have a family history or um, for pancreatic cancer, can we start early on to measure that in urine and see if there is a change and then can kind of have a warning system saying, hey, that now it's changing, maybe we should go for, the person should go for a screening. Uh, another way I think was good to look at, I uh, think isotope is a uh, prognostic tool for prostate cancer. For prostate cancer, it's, uh, um, we also know that the, the zinc metabolism is changing in the prostate. It's one of the tissues which also accumulates a lot of zinc. Um, and there is no good prognostic uh, tool for prostate cancer. So I measured, uh, a prostate, uh, looked at prostate cancer patients um, which have either a low risk of prostate cancer, then a me medium risk or a high risk. When, so that's the plot on the, on, the, um, on, the, on the right. So you see the normalized urine zinc concentration compared to the isotopic composition. And the ones in green up here, this basically is the one which in the range of healthy controls. Then this uh, red one is the one which have medium risk for prostate cancer. It's like slowly goes down to what's uh, a, a light isotopic composition. And then if you look at the one, uh, the blue one, these are the ones with very high risk of uh, pro sorry, prostate cancer. Um, they have a much lighter isotopic uh, zinc composition in their urine. And that's what we interpret is like with, again, when you develop a prostate cancer, there is the, um, uh, the effect of inflammation. Inflammation causes oxidative stress and then uh, sulfur cysteine binding sites basically are oxidized and then remove, brings in, uh, uh, you excrete all the light um, zinc isotopes from the oxidation of the sulfur binding sites. Um, and the same has been done, um, that they're not the same, but then looking at what you said for, before it was breast cancer, we did another study uh, with Kai uh, Sullivan. Um, looking at not only the zinc isotopic composition of the malignant tissue and the healthy tissue, so something also the neighboring tissue. So we have the, if you think of our, a tumor, then you have tissue around it, which is healthy, but might be impacted or affected already uh, by inflammation from the tumor. And then you have very healthy, healthy tissue uh, from someone who, uh, um, from uh, a breast tissue, by uh, uh, press reduction or something. Uh, and then what is the difference there? And we see there that we, and then we have also another, it's like not malignant tissue, but we have also benign uh, cancer. And what we see is for the zinc isotopic composition that malignant and benign are isotopically lighter compared to the healthy tissue. That's the one on the left. Uh, but there is no difference be between benign and malignant. But what we are always worried about is the tumor malignant or not. So that's, we can say, when you're looking directly at the tissue, we cannot tell. Um, maybe, but as I said, we can look at other um, biospecimen to identify that. So then uh, what we also think when we think of now, we are always exposed to metals all the time, every day. Uh, by the air we breathe, the food we eat, the water we are drinking. So, but of all these sources, we don't know, most of the time we, didn't, we don't regularly measure what's the metal concentration in our drinking water, what's the metal concentration in our food, or we don't even know what's in the air. Um, but we are exposed to them all the time. And if you think of lead, 
living in New York and you have a lot of exposure to lead. So lead can come from very different sources. We have lead in the air, of course, air pollution. We can have lead from secondhand smoking. We have lead in the paint. We have lead in the water, in the food, from the pipes. So we are all exposed to that and lead, what I said, stays in our body for a long time, for several decades. It's um, incorporated in our bones. So how do we now, if you measure for what we do, well, uh, probably several in, in the US do that, they do the screening for children and the lead levels in, in blood. If the lead, lead, uh, lead level in blood is high, then they would recommend, okay, maybe it could be the pipe, then we can check the water, but you can check so many, as you see so many different sources. We don't know what's the contribution of all these different sources to the total lead level in this, in this child's blood. Um, so the, the good way would be look at the isotopes. So if we measure the lead isotopic composition in the, in the blood of the child, and then we look at the major contribution, let's say we look at the air uh, lead levels, and then we look at the water lead levels and isotopic composition, and maybe we can, by that, we can rule out is uh, water really contributing a lot to that uh, children's, uh, to this child's uh, lead level or not, or what is the contribution to the overall total lead in this, let's say 20% comes from the air, 30% comes from the pipe, and 50% comes from uh, secondhand smoke. That, that's the idea, that's uh, how we can uh, disentangle the different exposure sources. And that has been done, not in that extent, but it has been done uh, looking at the lead isotopic composition, rice, hair, and house dust. They wanted to understand what, what do we find, uh, um, so it's like lead 207 to over 206, and then um, they found that the house dust contributes the most to our hair, and the rice, the lead exposure we get from the rice is much less, and we'll not find it in the hair. Um, yeah. So what also what we are doing right now, so I'm uh, at Columbia, we have, um, I'm part of a super fun program. We are working in the Dakotas uh, with the um, uh, Okolala Lakota uh, uh, tribes there. And we are working on how to understand um, their exposure to toxic metals. As it's known, that uh, Native Americans are exposed to have higher levels of metals, especially arsenic and uranium, but also lead. Um, and we wanted to understand first from the point, the exposure they have in the, from the environmental scale. So we are going to create um, maps using isotopes to understand, using isotope maps to understand what are the reac reaction in the environment. And then from there we go, To drink water here, example, uranium, arsenic, and selenium. So uranium is an element, it has isotopes, arsenic not, but arsenic is toxic, it can lead to oxidative stress. And what I said, oxidative stress changes our expression, uh, changes um, the binding sites of metals, so we can also measure that. So we want we are going to work on making an ice, a map for isotopes for the water and then from, from urine from the human body to understand the metabolic processes in the human body and the exposure route. Because what it does when we have, when we are ex chronically exposed to different metals, for example, um, arsenic, uranium, and lead. Um, and if you think of um, now bringing another element, it's selenium. It's selenium can be toxic, but it is also essential. Um, so what it does, we have um, normally, so we are in homeostasis, this would be that, this arrow. But if you expose from our water, and we all, in every water we find uranium, and in every water we find a little bit of arsenic. It causes inflammation and oxidative stress, and it changes the redox balance in our body. And then when we, for example, what we, we are going to, what we want to do is like selenium is a very important um, antioxidant. Uh, it actually helps to capture the oxidative uh, stress from ex exposure to arsenic and uranium. Um, but uh, uh, that imbalance because of the other toxic metal will shift it. And that's, we will probably see, we will most likely see it 
in the urine signal from the isotopes um, because then we excrete more lighter isotopes um, than heavy isotopes if we are having, um, I mean, we are under oxidative stress or we methylate selenium because um, um, we have some methylation pathways to detoxify if it's too much selenium. So the idea is if um, we are exposed to uh, toxic metals, uh, then we have a lighter selenium isotopic signal in the urine. And if we are not exposed, then uh, we have almost no uranium, arsenic or lead in the water because we did either an intervention with filters and cleaning up the water, then the isotopic signal would be, uh, let's imagine like zero, like kind of the natural distribution. So um, this was just an <laughs> overview and I think I have more questions and answers. So what I think uh, we, the idea is for the isotope metallomics and how we can use metal isotopes in the environmental health science field and biomedical field is like we can, it is a very robust uh, method because it's very, very sensitive. However, our understanding or studies are very limited so far. It has to be done more studies, um, more on the fundamental uh, mechanisms, how isotope fractions in the body, uh, which are the best bi um, biospecimens to use for different approaches. So if you want to look at exposure routes, is it better to use blood versus urine? It all depends also on the element. Um, also, uh, we need to have studies with larger numbers of patients. If you think of a disease right now, I think the largest studies have maybe 30 people, but we need maybe hundreds and we need different age groups and gender. Um, but I think it has huge potential, definitely as an exposure marker. That's probably the easiest to fingerprint the sources of exposure to toxic metals. But it also can help us to understand meta metabolic pathways. If you think of essential metals like copper and zinc, for example, zinc, uh, an element which is so much, for example, in India, zinc deficiency, we can understand like the better the nutrient status of people and just measuring the concentration. And I think it has, which is a bit more difficult, but a disease marker for early detection, maybe for, for some type of cancer. Um, so that's why my idea is always we should in the future, um, medical scientists and isotope scientists should work closer together. Then we can make that a very powerful tool in the environmental health sciences field or biomedical field. Um, these are all the people I, I work with. Uh, so I would like the last, I think, six years. Um, and that's uh, the group uh, I work with. It's uh, the lab at, at Columbia. This are the, uh, the in, on the bottom photo, there's uh, all the graduate students. And that's the isotope lab I work with. And that's the, um, some agency I work with, uh, working um, our Superfund program our Center for Environmental Health in Northern Manhattan and environmental, they now added environmental justice to it. And then I thank you <laughs> for <laughs> And if you have questions, just please email me and ask any questions you like. <laughs> uh, thank you, Catherine. That is fascinating. <laughs> Whoa, so yeah, let's open it up for questions. Jackie. I have a ton of questions. Oh, good. <laughs> Go ahead. Simply. So um, clearly you, you, you put out there that, you know, for this has really been in the realm of the geologists for at least the past five to 10 years, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. And the challenge is getting it accepted in a clinical setting. Um, you know, like, you know, if you're in a hospital and you're suffering from something, they're going to want a test that's going to be like, you know, instantaneous. You're going to get those isotope measurements in. Well, if you spend time in Maryland, where I am, in an emergency room, four hours, because you're going to be sitting there for at least four hours. <laughs> you know, that is, isotopes don't lend themselves to that. They don't. So, you know, what other approaches can you use? I mean, is there a thought to be using, um, you know, either a AI type approaches and, and, and machine learning approaches with the data that you can have? And then is there a thought for um, developing other types of uh, measurement techniques besides our typical multi-collectors um, that may be able to, you know, like 
may be able to get you data that would be good enough if you call it, you know, fit for yes. purpose. I mean, it's always, oh. a matter, it's always a matter of precision. And uh, probably, first of all, I would say it's not always that you get, for example, for cancer, the result instantaneously or it was in hours. For pancreatic cancer, it takes months to get the results after the biopsy. It's actually mm -hmm. not when I received the urine samples from pancreatic cancer patient, it was not even clear if they have a pancreatic cancer or if they have a pancreatitis or so. Mm -hmm. So it took two months um, to really make sure it is unfortunately pancreatic cancer, but nothing can be done when you have it, but probably your survival rate is very low. So mm -hmm. I think even if you do a measurement within 24, 48 hours, and that's probably doable with isotopes, uh, you're still good. Um, I would not say, probably it's not going to be a technique where you do it on hundreds and thousands of people, right. not at least for the isotope part, but as you don't do a biopsy with everyone, you just think like who has a bit of stomach pain and think maybe of pancreatic cancer, you don't do a biopsy right away. Like the same way, when you see it's something critical, you can get a sample and I would, that's why we need to test what samples then should we get then? Should we get a urine sample? Should we get a blood sample? Should we get both? Um, even with the, with the, even if you think of a biopsy and then the, the tools they're using now to do the screening for pancreatic cancer, maybe you can include isotopes there too to verify that it's pancreatic cancer. Uh, and that could be probably done within what I said, 48 hours instead of two months currently. Right. And the precision, sorry, and the precision is, uh, yeah, there might be different approaches um, to maybe have a larger uh, throughput for samples. Uh, right now that it doesn't have to be the super expensive facility in, in a clean lab and what it is, requires right now. But even for concentration metal uh, measurements of metals in biospecimens, you re need a relatively clean environment to measure, mm -hmm. let's say, low levels of uranium in urine and see that people are exposed. So the settings you probably will re really need. And in, in New York at Mount Sinai, they have this facility, we have this facility um to, to to do that it's just a matter to be like faster uh um in or the numbers of samples to increase the sample size mm -hmm. right do you foresee uh, taking this kind of out of an academic environment into like a you know opening a private you know, a lab that like is dedicated to doing things like that <laughs> uh I think it's like it, the best way would be first a hospital which uh, has the facility where, which you are, where they already do kind of a metal analysis and then mm -hmm. they say they would like to um, invest in that uh, additional right. um, Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, I, I guess one of the questions I had gotten from the bio folks for us was like, well, you know, you're going to need thousands of points of data to prove that these, you know, techniques work because that's what they've always done. So I, you know, and I, you know, I think what they're missing is that the sensitivity of isotopes is completely different as you know, than <laughs> just measuring a concentration. So, but because they don't, you know, are not used to that, they don't think about it that way. And I was like, yeah, well, you have to work with biostaticians who, uh, prove the statistical power of your data set. And I think what you you say is right because it's uh, two orders of mind more sensitive. You need a smaller sample size to prove it, which makes it then also cheaper than if you think you need 7,000 samples versus maybe 70 or 100 samples. Yeah, your clinical yeah. trial would be a little bit less expensive, which would be nice, right? <laughs> so, mm -hmm. Sorry, I, I will stop monopolizing. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, no, I think it's really fun to hear that. If you have more questions, please go ahead. It's just, you know, it's a very unique, you know, it's a unique application in, in this isotope metal mix in general. So I think there's challenges that with, with this field that are very different than, you know, what you're typically thinking when you're doing isotope work. <laughs> so that's, yeah. It's more like started again from the back, like looking at the humans, looking at, what we see the difference in humans, like, oh, these are different. I mean, it's cool, but it's like, how? Why are these different? And we right. haven't like, done the very little pieces to put together to say, oh, that could be the mechanism that causes this different, and this is the mechanism that causes that different. We just like, 
hypothesize or assume that this is the difference, but have no proof. So now we start going mm -hmm. back and say like, oh, what do proteins do? Uh, what do fraction A? How do they fraction isotopes? And then we go to the next step and the next step. And then finally we can actually go to the human and then we can actually go to the disease part. But we started with the disease part and then now um, to the protein part. I do have another question if nobody else has any. Kind of go related. ahead, yeah. <laughs> Yes. So related to, you were talking about the cysteine and the histine and how, you know, the heavier isotopes, I think like the histine and light is for cysteine. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. for cysteine, um, you said it binds with the sulfur. Yeah. Is there any um, worth to also measuring the sulfur isotope composition to, to in combination, like, is there changes? Like if it's a redox based reaction, I would think, or, you know, metal binding with sulfur, I think things are going to change there. <laughs> Exactly. But uh, so it's sulfite, it's a uh, sulfite, and then sulfite okay. minus two goes to plus four, but yeah. it can relatively quickly go back. Um, that might be you can measure it probably in urine, but I'm not sure how. That is. Um, I mean, the good thing is with sulfur, you have much larger isotropic fractionation. Uh, yeah. We have done it for this liver cancer study, they have looked at copper and sulfur. But I, as I remember it, right, the copper signal was much more pronounced than the sulfur signal. Interesting. Well, sulfur is harder probably also because <laughs> it's just much more ubiquitous anyway. Um, but uh, interesting. Okay. Sorry. That was just curiosity on my part. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? Okay. Oh, Donna, go ahead. Yeah. I, I, you know, I was really excited to see that it might be an application for ovarian cancer because it's been so depressing to lose so many people when there was no indication at all until it's too late. Now, was that a urine test or a blood test? I think it was a, that is a blood. Mm -hmm. They use blood sample. I think they're much easier is uh, if, there's, if you can do it in urine because at first you can get, give more samples more often. It's better for screening. Um, of course, for some metals might be the limitation is like the concentrations are much lower than in blood. Like copper is, I think, at least uh, 10 to 100 times higher than in urine, uh, mm. for sure. Uh, zinc is super easy in, in urine. Um, um, for example, if you think, um, if you think of cadmium, we are exposed to for smokers and secondhand smokers, cadmium would be good in, 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 in blood, for example, if you look at exposure. Thank you. Yeah. But yeah, that's, it's, it's, it's always fascinating how people started like one, it's basically started with one cancer study and then everybody got like two different types of cancer. See, do we see the same signal? But then now we have to understand, do we see this, is the signal unique to a cancer or to cancer in general, you know? It's not like when we say we screen it and we say, oh, we see a difference. But then if this difference occurs, no matter what cancer you develop, we still don't know. Is it, is it, yeah. is it ovarian cancer? Is it breast cancer? Is it uh, pancreatic cancer? Is it liver cancer? Then it has to be unique to a cancer. <laughs> yeah, that's why we need to do more studies also which elements are unique for the particular, for a specific cancer. More questions. Jackie, do you have more? <laughs> I mean, go ahead. It's really no, 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 no. I was okay. just no, I was just just thinking, cogitating on everything. It's it's <laughs> I, I mean it it's the researcher side of me that I don't get the things I don't get to do those types of things, but <laughs> so from a standards perspective, um, you know, I was thinking of something as simple, but a st probably simple to most people, but uh, a, for people who produce standards is a very important subject. So if something like urine, you know, to deliver a standard that is long-term that you can use in the community for a long period of time, like 20 years, 30 years, you know, how do you produce a standard mm -hmm. that will last that long and be stable? Good thing about it, again, isotopes, as you said, is that uh, they don't really change. But, you know, like for urine, would you, you know, is it freeze-dried urine better than, um, I don't know, frozen oh, urine and things like in blood, same thing, you know, is it, it better to have it um, uh, a frozen blood or, or, you know, just all these. I, I, think, I would say freeze-dried is always better. As my experience with concentration measurements, we have freeze-dried blood and we have freeze-dried urine. Um, yeah. They're more stable and we have, 
and that also filtered. So it's all, when they have the sediment in urine, then it gets difficult. Yes, I've worked with urine, <laughs> but actually from a radioactive element side. And that's always fun because when that sediment starts to drop out, the radioactive particles like to just go right to that sediment. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, yeah. but yeah. And acidified urine or not acidified? Because I get a lot of people who like, we have customers that are like, oh yeah, acidify it. And then some are like, no, don't do that. So yeah, there's a balance with that too. <laughs> hey, any other questions? All right, well, once again, Catherine, thank you so much. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Stay in touch, stay in touch. Yeah. and I will join yes. the next time. <laughs> okay, all right, we will. And Definitely. thanks to all for joining in tonight. This is great. Good way thanks. to kick off our series. <laughs> Enjoy it, Dina. Bye. Okay. Thank you.